Blog Talk Radio. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Now, red pill... Rational. Propaganda. Media. Radio. Welcome to Rational Propaganda Media Radio. This is your host, Jason Tillman. Uh, we have Anon Aaron, and we have a very special guest host tonight, uh, Kuleem Stevens, uh, also known as Justice Lee. Hey, Aaron, are you there? Uh, I guess not. Well, we're experiencing technical difficulties today. Uh, It happens in this wonderful technological world that we live in. makes life so much easier. It also creates problems, right? (laughs) So, Aaron, are you there? I'm here, buddy. Well, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. How are you? Oh, not Looking too bad. To our show. Yes, yes. I've been um, I've been uh, looking forward to this show all week, and um, we have a guest host tonight, uh, Kuleem Stevens, uh, also known as Justice Lee. Hello, how are you guys. Doing? Well, hello. Hello, how are you? Doing tonight? I'm good. I am absolutely excellent. I get to talk to you two wonderful people tonight. (laughs) Well, thank you. So uh, let me let me uh, tell our our listeners and also Anon Aaron a little bit about um, about you, Kuleem. Well, first off, you pronounce your name Kuleem. Yes. Sometimes people get it wrong. It's like cool <laughs> lean. Cool lean. Most so. of the time people get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it took it took me a week or two, you know, really hone in on on it. I think I must have asked you about a half a dozen times. Um Kuleem here uh stays pretty busy. She's a model, a singer, an actress, an entertainer, and if that isn't enough, she's also a political activist, a writer, military veteran, and to top it off, a wrestler. (laughs) And we do public speaking, too. Wow. And then uh, I also know that you've uh, volunteered... uh, help out the veterans a a number of different times so I mean the list could really go on but we'll just leave it up to that but how how can you how can you stay so busy Uh, I like staying busy I was raised by great grandparents who said that you know if you weren't busy then you had time to get in trouble so I think I just carried that over and just kept busy so I don't get in trouble (laughs) Well, I I know there's a high demand out there for you. Um, You know, consider you a local Tucson celebrity. And um, you've even spent some time in Washington. Oh, yeah. We've gone to Capitol Hill several times and done legislative and congressional briefings, things like that with Star Parker and Alveda King and a lot of different things. We met up with Ted Cruz and Ben Carson. We have a lot of fun. Holy cow. Holy cow. Well, that's... <laughs> what do you think of good old Ted Cruz? He was actually pretty cool. I was wow, I was amazed because a lot of people that we get to meet out on the road, you know, they're, they're in such high demand that their demeanor is a little bit snotty, kind of. 
But no, he was very friendly. He stayed and took pictures with everybody and talked with everybody. So he was actually pretty nice. Yeah, he seems like a uh, down-to-earth guy. Definitely, definitely. So um, I want to jump right into the meat of the situation. Um, I was watching my local news here, local Tucson News, and uh, I happened to see you on it. (laughs) <laughs> yes, that would be me. <laughs> you were um, actually addressing a a very difficult subject matter, um, stalking. And yes, and along with that, we were also addressing the police department's response to issues such as stalking. Okay, and that that probably goes under the. Um, same thing with domestic violence and uh, yes. and just abuse in in relationships. Uh, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be within relationships either. It can be from a total stranger. Wow, you mean like so? I have a radio program, and a total stranger would just maybe get obsessed with me, and and then start. Oh uh, yeah, they can infiltrating they like my your personal voice. life. Yes, they could decide they like your voice and never have seen you before and decide to just start following you everywhere. Wow, that's kind of scary. What do you think about that, Aaron? I am oh, just kind of sitting here thinking and listening to uh, what she has to say. I I don't have as much experience um, with Kaleem, so... I'm just checking out her website and stuff and seeing what's going on. Looks very interesting, actually. Yeah, well, what do you think about the um, stalker situation? Like, um, have you ever had a problem with the stalker? Uh, No. No. Have you ever been on the other end where you were stalking someone? Well, not that I know of. Oh, okay. (laughs) Have I I ever stalked someone? No. Not not much. (laughs) Just Facebook stalking. Just... (laughs) That's different. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I I've seen some of your you know some of your posts uh, with the Facebook stalkers. Um, well, social media is new, so that kind of throws uh, law enforcement and the whole entire justice system for a loop. Because with the internet being so big now, you actually have people in different states that will cause havoc and stalk people online. They'll follow you on uh, Facebook, Twitter, you know, Google. Everything is is so open on the Internet. You can actually go on the Internet and find anybody's address, phone number, relatives, you know, anything like that. Their addresses, their phone numbers, and they can literally stalk you online now. So it's a whole new ballgame for our justice system. So they don't know how to deal with it quite yet. They're learning. A few of the states are catching up, but it's really hard to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and you're you're right. It's uh, pretty new. I uh, I remember seeing a uh, a TED talk um, from Monica Lewinsky, and she claimed to. Uh, she was kind of framing herself as the uh, first victim of cyberbullying because the oh, internet wow. was so new, and because of the the all the controversy and uh, hoo ha there, uh, you know there was a lot of bullies. So and and it right. seems like it seems like it's still a problem. Yes, so, it can be. And uh, I've seen how you've dealt with it. I really respect how you deal with it uh, in social media where, uh, you know, obviously you have the option to block them. And if they cross your line of comfort, uh, you block them and then you make it public what they did or what they said. And sometimes it can be a little embarrassing for them. Yeah, that was the only way I knew how to to deal with it online because even with Facebook, you can report you know, posts and things like that, but they're not set up to deal with social media stalkers yet that way, and cyberbullying is is the same thing. They're not really set up for it, so when you first complain, it takes numerous complaints on one post just to get something removed or even to have it dealt with. Like with my situation, I actually had to send in police reports 
to Facebook and have our police department here send in police reports and say, hey, you know, there's an injunction of harassment here. You know, you've got to put a stop to this on your site. So, you know, that was the only way I knew how was to call it out publicly first. There's not a lot of help out there um, dealing with social media and stalking just yet, but it's getting there. We're hopefully going to start changing some laws for this and and make everything to where it works a little bit smoother for law enforcement. Even the detectives will have to be trained to deal with stalking because there's when they do, they usually put it underneath domestic violence because that's where stalking used to occur. But there's different types of stalkers. So there's about seven different types and not all of them are ones that are the where you've had a relationship with a person. Like a, there's a, one of the types is a resentful stalker, and that might be someone that you just ran across in a store who hit on you, and you turned them down, and they didn't like that, and then they start stalking you, so you don't even know so, this person. So they're having trouble dealing with rejection. Right. Right. So how they deal they, with it is they, they get mad at you. Right. And, well, there's, oh. let's see, the rejected stalker, you know, those are the ones that they, when the relationship ends, you know, or, or they don't, they don't feel like they got a fair shake in the relationship, then you have your resentful stalker. That one should be one that actually is really, really dangerous. They want to actually get revenge on a person who upset them. Um, there's the predatory stalker. Those are really, really dangerous. Um, they actually um, stalk people for long periods of time, years, in fact, and it's hard to get rid of those. The intimacy seeker, those are different. They were already, that's where your domestic violence comes into play is because they've already had a relationship with the person, and they and then they get delusional, and those are the ones that usually will end up with the domestic violence where you see them doing the murder, suicide, things like that. You have what, your what incompetent you shooter. Why do they? Why do you think they call them an intimacy? Why? Why do, they, do you think they use that term? Um, because those are a, the ones that are saying, "If I can't have you, then nobody will." Those are the ones that think that they love that person so much that if they can't have them, nobody will. Okay. And wow. They, that's those scary. are the ones that get really, really scary. They become yeah. They they become threatening and violent. So call the, you know, their, their person they're talking on the phone. Those are the ones that will send gifts, like you can open up your door and find a box of presents outside your door, things like that. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen that. They're trying that to get their person back, you know, into their life. I've seen that kind of personality in action, and and that that is, a, you know, I, I guess I would, I would say it was a personality disorder of some sort, because... Gosh, I mean, common sense or logic would dictate there's plenty of fish in the sea. Right. You, know, but you don't I think have to. Even for stalking, it, it it takes a lot. They they probably do have a mental disorder. That's actually described in most of the the descriptions where they they don't think correctly. Because once a person says no, they don't want to have anything to do with you, and to stop bothering them, then that for normal people clicks and says, hey, okay, I better leave this person alone. Once, you know, you go past and you keep having to say, leave me alone, that shows a little bit of mental instability going on there. Well, I, all I can say is, is, is in all these cases, revenge or a predatory or intimacy, it kind of defies logic and common sense. But what are, the, what are some of the other ones? Um, there's the incompetent suitor. Those are the ones that they actually do. They start a relationship with the person and but they're kind of impaired with their skills so they don't click with that person and they end up getting dumped so then they end up stalking because they want to you know try and get to know the person still and then there's also the morbidly infatuated person that's one that can see a picture of you anywhere or you know hear your voice like what I was talking about earlier they could hear your voice on the radio and decide that they're in love and then they start following you from there. Um, those people, they said the personality type of those types are, uh, they may suffer from acute paranoia and delusions, things like that. Oh, and usually the like person they that they're stalking is a, 
no, well, no, they, well, yeah, they think that they're having a relationship with the person. <laughs> they, they actually do. They, they will, um, and usually it's like, that's where the stars come in, where you have your public figures, your hosts, your models, things like that. They get the morbid people because they don't, the, the stalker doesn't know that person per se. They've just known what they see on TV or hear on radio or, you know, hear their music and decide that they're all of a sudden in love. Right, and that's not who the person is, even on my radio show. I am not, this isn't exactly who I am in my personal life. You'd have to get to know me. But right. They, don't, they can't quite, they can't quite grasp that, that simple logic. Okay. That's wow. right. And so, right now we're actually lucky because California actually set up the laws for, they were the first state to set up the laws for stalking. So now all 50 states do have them. We just need to correct them because they're not up to date right now. They kind of just got thrown in there. So they tried to deal with it as best they could, hence the reason why most of it falls under harassment or aggravated harassment or domestic violence. Because most of your shocking actually does occur during um, a domestic violence dispute, and a lot of it doesn't get reported. And it takes a long time to get uh, attention to your case in any type of stalking or even domestic violence issue because it's, it's, you don't always get results. You can go out and get a restraining order, and basically all that restraining order is is a an extensive piece of paper because you literally have to wait for the person to come at you, you know, and be in your face before. And then by the time the cops get there, if you're able to call the police, then you have to, you know, the person has to still be there. And if they're not there, then there's very little that you can do. So they'll, oh, they may put out a warrant for the person's arrest, or they may not. They'll just say, call us back if he shows up again. So it's it's nice to maybe have audio or video footage, some kind of proof of what, what you're going through. Right. If you can, and but that, it's that, hard enough. That would be like the biggest thing that I would say is if you can, take a picture, take video, have witnesses there all around you if you can. A lot of times people are very sneaky and don't let people, you know, take pictures or they don't, they'll, the stalkers will try and find you away from people and try and get you away from your fans, your family. Most of the people, especially during domestic violence, would be actually, um, they move them away from their family and their friends. They take them away from them. They, they literally uh, keep you hostage, basically. So then there's nobody to run to for help. So and then that I think would be a lot easiest. of a lot of the big problem there. I I think is is kind of like a Stockholm syndrome thing. Then yeah, sometimes they they mess with your mind and they abuse you to the point where you're not going to be strong enough to protect yourself in that situation. And I by videotaping or audio taping and and that kind of get brings me to uh, you know what you're doing. Um, that that strategy of of bringing light to this difficult situation and even making it public and exposing uh, what's going on for for public opinion uh, is that uh, how do you come up with that strategy and it, well, has it been effective? That isn't necessarily for like public opinion. When I chose to take it public was because. Like with mine, with my own specific case, I was dealing with someone who works around the public and a lot of other people have had issues with that person too, but nobody really was saying anything. So more people had been getting hurt in the process. So with, with mine, you know, the person had already been accused of sexually assaulting somebody and then, you know, come to find out he's stalking me and won't leave me alone. And then, you know, the next week, another story's popping up of, oh, he turned total creeper on somebody else at, you know, the bar and that when the, you know, other person was working at. So I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, okay, the reason why, you know, this continues to go on is because nobody's saying anything and nobody's bringing this out. So I chose to deal with it just like I deal with the people who send me their little peepees in their, in my inbox, you know, when they, when they, because with the modeling that comes with it, and I usually publish those public on my page when I get them, because I get tired of them and tag their wives to them, so I figured I'd apply the same logic to that, too, and make it public, so that way people know, hey, this is dangerous, stay away from this person. 
Well, hey, thanks for having the strength to inform other people of, of possible problems. Uh, where do yeah, you come up tough. with that strength? Yeah, well, how, how do you get it, that? I mean, it's uh, it would be hard for me. You know, I would. I, I have no idea. Right? What was that? I have Eric? a question. Yeah, I, I have a question. Okay. I, I guess if if. Is stalking a matter of scale as far as in, you know, somebody just goes above and beyond in order to do this? Or, I mean, I mean, what exactly, what exactly is stalking? Have, what have exactly? never really been, I mean, I, I understand uh, the general concept, but at what level does it become stalking as opposed to just, oh, hey, this was a bad relationship or something and, and you guys go your separate ways? Um, well, stalking more or less would be, um, there's different legal, uh, definitions of stalking, but what the basic one is, is, um, a course of conduct directed as, at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to feel fear. Now, when they're talking about feeling fear, they're talking about, um, it's kind of like what veterans go through PTSD, where it interrupts your, your actual living skills and things like that. Um, what happens is, like, some of the things that stalkers would do would be they follow, follow you everywhere, they show up wherever you are, send gifts, letters, cards, emails, they damage your home, car, or other property, they monitor your calls at times and then they use the computer social media to follow you there they use uh, some even go as far as using technology like hidden cameras and they'll use GPS so they can track you which is one big thing that Facebook is going to have to change if once we start getting these laws because you know they have that close to you friends near you so they can actually track you and see where you're at on, on social media through Facebook or they show up at your school or your work, things like that, over and over, or they threaten you. And they can do a number of things, which qualifies it for stalking would be once they keep doing it and they keep doing it. Um, most of the time it takes okay. an injunction of harassment or, or a restraining order, and if they keep violating it so many times, then it'll go into the, the classification of stalking. And I'm assuming okay. this is all after you've made it very clear to leave me alone, stay out of my life. Yes. Yes, you actually do have to tell these the people to leave you alone, stay out of your life, and you actually do have to um, let other people know that you want that other person to stay away too. Because if it's just you, and then you turn around and you go back to the person, especially during domestic violence relationships, often women and some men um, go back to the person that, doing the abuse and so that makes it a little bit harder because then the police don't want to take you seriously once you start showing that you're serious that you don't want this person around you then things will go a lot smoother so what do you what what do you suggest for um someone that that's experiencing or feel they might be experiencing some of these um kind of situations and of course they you know do some research and and check to see if uh, they really are going through something like that. What 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 is what is the plan of attack that that you would recommend having the experience? Document everything if you can. Um, they and call the police each and every time something happens because if it's not recorded legally, then they can't really say anything happened. Um, the national uh, resource. For stocking, they actually do have uh, the stocking resource center. They do have like a log where you can keep date and time and pictures and things like that that you can print off on the computer at your library or if you have a, a printer at home, you can print those off. They give a lot of good tips on on the site. That's one of the better sites for um, people to use for stocking. Okay. There's a lot of places that you can call to get help. They give you the same things. They, they have a victim's connection on there um, as a resource center. It'll, they ask you questions on there saying, are you being stalked? It's a brochure, and you can read over and see if you, if you fall into those categories, then more than likely you're going to want to stay on that site and look through it and get the help. And that's uh, the victimsofcrime.org is, is where victims. the stalking resource center is. Victimsofcrime.org. Victims dot org okay and then great and it looks like you're able to that yourself um 
you know, with all these these different resources and and the the local police here in Tucson, we know how you've dealt with it on a personal level and uh, having these resources. But how does uh, how does it actually go uh, in practice in in life in real life? You know, it uh, gets tough. It's draining. It gets tough. Um, they're, you're gonna, they're, they would have to be really, really, really strong in order to go through it. I know myself, I, I had threatened to give up eight million times already on it, and just like, oh, I just want it to go away. Because you literally get dragged through court. You're sitting in there with, you know, the person that's doing all this to you, and you're forced to face them. Then you get the retaliatory stuff, you know, from their friends and their girlfriends or boyfriends. You know, they start... Uh, you know, using social media against you, talking about you, things like that. Um, it kind of feeds up, the fire, maybe? It feeds a the fire bit. a lot, yes, a lot. And then if you turn around and you say something back in social media, then that could hurt you in the long run. So you end up having to bite your tongue a lot and not say anything about it, just let them run their mouth. So it gets really, really tough. <laughs> You know, they'll go oh, yeah. after your work. They'll go after your job. You know, even with me, I had my car spray painted. You know, they it, they actually found my home. So it it gets really really tough. You've got to be really they came strong. By and have, they came by and marked your private property with spray paint, like yes, a like a dog. Right. It's well. It's called. They call it tagging. Um, it groups okay. in when they call it tagging. It's so that they can find you when you're out driving on the road. They'll spray paint it a bright color so, you know, your stalker can find you or when it gets to a certain point, like where they're making threats, you know, and their friends are making threats so their friends know where you're at, too, and they can actually okay. follow you that way. And in your case, with like, a bright pink. I was just going to say, it kind of seems like social media is actually helping to feed this a little bit. Yes, it does. It does, because there's not a lot of stuff you can do about it. Like, with mine, mine uh, it has been just going off nonstop about me on, on his Facebook page. You know, just nonstop. He goes after my work. He's tagged, you know, the disabled American veterans, the veterans of foreign wars. I was a KLPX girl here for the radio station, and he tagged them to it and was just going off nonstop. So, so that even actually if you block does feed him, it. it doesn't help. Even then if it you doesn't block help. It. Right. Wow. And there's also ways of getting around the block, too, because mine found a way to get around the block. So I could block and then ban them from all my pages. But once, I guess, you can deactivate your page and then reactivate, it gives a new IPS address, I guess, which Facebook doesn't recognize. So then they're able to come back and do wow. that again. Or they change pages. Like the one that I'm dealing with has, like, three different pages. You know, so that gets kind of tough, too, when they're able to make aliases, and then they're still able to come at you on social media. We need a real-life block button we can just push, and then, boom, the person disappears out of your life completely. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice, huh? Not just a yes. virtual one, but, yeah, there, it always seems like people find a way to, to get around it, so... Well, good yeah. luck with that. I, it sounds like it sounds like people also need a support group. With you know, it's, it's yes, and like actually they do list those on on that website that I gave earlier. They do have um, people that you can call. There's several sites that you can, and also on the Last Civil Right, which is the other group I work for. They we actually I wrote an article on this, you know, with um, talking about their stalking and things, and I gave all the listings of all the different places that you could go for help and they have a survivor help on there they have support groups on there you can meet people in your local areas things like that it takes a while to filter through because that's why i end up writing the actual article and i'll send that to you jason because i actually did write it up there so it's easier for people to find and sift through and get the help that they need because they do need support groups. It gets really tough and you want to give up, but you got to keep going. If you want it to stop, you have to keep going. It can take up to, like with my case, they told me it could take up to a year to get it done and over with while it's in, you know, in the legal process in court. Right now I'm going through superior court with my court case and it's, it's a bear, but it's a challenge, but I have to keep going. If I don't, then, you know, it could all start up again and keep going. You never know how long stalkers are going to go for. So 
You know, in right. my case, my stalker had already been in trouble once. He went to prison once for doing the same thing. So <laughs> you never know how long that kind of thing will go. So you have to stick with it if you want to see some results, and it does get tough. The, um, and then the Victim's Advocate Office, and they have one in every state at the county attorney's office or district attorney, whichever one your state calls it. They have advocates there that can help you as well, and they also have all the different resources that, to help victims of stalking and domestic violence too. So those are great people to get in touch with once like, you get into the legal system and you start fighting the cases. It sounds like a, a great, uh, great amount of support out there um, to deal with uh, this rampant problem. Um, and you brought up your the site, the Last Civil Right dot org. Yes. Is that where where you're at? Okay. And yes. do you have a Facebook page too for that? Oh, they can. Yes, we have the Last Civil Right is on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and. Links, okay. I believe. <laughs> We're everywhere. Super. All you need to do is Google the last civil right and we'll come up. Well, we should definitely uh, encourage people to uh, check that out. Um, yes, definitely. I will. Yeah, yeah. I, I've read a few few of your blogs, and uh, yeah, I, I like how you, you go out there, you write, you put it out there, how you see things. Um with That's why our, our little saying is saying things others were, are afraid to say. Because <laughs> yeah. we're pretty blunt. All of us girls are pretty blunt. You know, if you like us, you like us. If you don't, you don't. You know, if you don't want to read our blog, then don't read it. If you, you know, like what we say, please let us know. You know, so we're we're very open. We, we try to look at things with common sense. So it seems to work. <laughs> well, and, and I really like how you... I'm sorry, Aaron. What? I was just saying that's a great philosophy. If you don't yeah. like what we say, you just don't listen. That's actually well, awesome. And, and and that's one of the one of the things I I, I definitely respect about uh, the last civil right group here is uh, they're very open minded. Um, I was talking to um, a local homeless activist um, just just last night. Uh, we were messaging. Uh, his, his name's Anthony Potter. Do you know who I'm talking about, Colleen? I know Anthony. He's our photographer for our wrestling shows. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, he's uh, he's a homeless activist. Uh, he was uh, he's part of the Occupy movement. Um, he uh, he's quite a good guy. He's quite a good guy. He's standing up, uh, trying to trying to make a positive impact, and uh, he is just completely floored by you, Kulim. He told me that, um, you know, he knows you, that you're great, a great person, a great activist, an entertainer worth uh, going to see on a regular basis, um, and that you even provide wise words on how to survive on independence and liberty. Oh, I try, and but he does the same thing. He's about as outspoken as I am. <laughs> He's yeah. actually been up to our city council and and gone out there and stood up for the homeless. So that is actually fabulous. Not very many people would do that. No, no, and and he's uh, he's also a voice on. Uh, um, you know, on social media about what's going on, being the voice uh, for people out there um, that maybe don't have the courage to stand up and, yeah, confront the city council and, and everything else. So, uh, yeah, but he he just couldn't uh, speak highly enough uh, of you there um, and some of your volunteering. Um as far as the homeless, have you heard about um, this uh, this kind of activism, this patriot movement uh, activists here uh, in Arizona called uh, Veterans on Patrol? Yes, I just heard? looked at that today. That is an amazing organization. It seems to be. It's uh, definitely a um, a grassroots movement. Um, I think at, they'll get a lot of, of support by being a grassroots movement. Yeah, yeah, they, um, 
or current or I, I guess retired veterans, I want to definitely go out and uh, check out more of this. Uh, they're trying to. They're saying that you know an issue that I know you deal with. Um, our veterans in our country haven't been getting the support they need from the uh, promises. No, not at all. Their service. <laughs> not at all. We're working, well, I'm, I work as a service officer with a disabled American veteran, so that's where I get to hear about it. And the DAV is, is actually challenging a lot of things with the VA and, and even with Congress. They're very vocal. So is the Veterans of Foreign Wars, the American Legion. All of the veteran organizations are pushing to get more help. Just our veterans... They deserve that. They they volunteered their time for this country. So, you know, the least we can do is take care of them when we when they come back home, and when we're not given the tools to do so, that that's kind of embarrassing for our country that we can't take care of the people who fight for our freedoms here. Well, what do you think it boils on? I mean, just just try to boil it down. I know putting th- a very complex situation in a simple term. Um, is really lacking, but if you boiled it down, uh, basically, what what's the problem? Are they just bad with the money? They're not they're not allocating. It, it, a basic answer would be it's politics. Everything gets attached to everything else. So your VA benefits may be attached to some other what they would call pork, some other bill, which you have to decide. You know whether you want this to pass or that to pass. You either have to vote yes on the whole thing or no on the whole thing. So, you know, and then funding that, you know, they they would decide that funding needs to go elsewhere other than, you know, places. Because when they go up to Congress, they have to hear about funding for all different kinds of things. So then the veterans get put on the back burner. Like this year, the veterans are not going to get their 10% raise like they normally do because we're funding other stuff right now. Wow. Well, Congress, treat our people better. That's what I say. One of the one of the 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 catch twenty twos in this situation is, uh, you know, you're entitled to medical and stuff, but if you don't have an address, you can't sign up for medical. Is that kind of how it works? Um, well, it's you can sign up for medical, but it's if you have to have surgery or anything like that. Like right now, I'm working with a homeless vet. He's a marine. He was living in a in a storage shed. We just came up with funds to put him in a hotel, and we're still looking for funds to help him out there, too. Um, we, um, he doesn't, he was in the storage unit, but since he doesn't have a physical address, he has to have surgery. Now, when you have surgery, they don't want to do the surgery and then have no place to send you to, you know, recuperate after surgery, so it makes it very hard. Um, overall, for benefits, if you don't have direct deposit, or if you don't have an address, or you don't even have an ID. A lot of our veterans don't even have an ID anymore because they've lost it, you know, somewhere. It got stolen because they're homeless. Then you can't really access any type of benefits whatsoever. Wow. That that just just absolutely floors me to, to think that it it actually works out that way. Right, and then it makes it harder because we have all these great ideas of how to help out with the homeless problem, even for it's not just the veterans, it's a homeless problem overall, is like with the schools here in Arizona that we've closed down. We've, t- we've closed down a ton of schools here, and, you know, we've asked to use those, and they usually say no because the community decides, no, we don't want, you know, all these homeless people around in our area. They, it's a catch-22 because they want something done about the homeless, but they don't want them in their general area and have to look at them, I guess. So I think that's make kind of sad. Make it go away? You know? Is that the mind frame? Make it, just make it go away? Yeah, just don't make it go it away. Tomorrow. Let's throw some money at it and, you know, just make it go away is basically what it is. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, I, I wish there was a solution, and, and it seems like... You know, uh, the powers that be, our leaders, send these these guys over to fight wars, and then they they come back with with. Uh, we hear a lot about PDS. Uh, oh, PTSD. Post traumatic stress syndrome. Yeah. Post traumatic. Is this um, 
you know, I, I've, in my mind, I've always equated it to the type of syndrome we've had throughout the history of war, whether it was uh, called shell shock or whatever other incarnation of the word. Um, so, wow, it's one thing about you, Cooley. Here you're tackling the the subject, a uh, very difficult you know, hard to solve subjects of uh, stalkers and domestic violence and bullying and and um, and then these kind of situations, uh, they, there obviously isn't a real easy, clear solution, but um, kudos for you. Kudos for you. Yeah, well, why, why don't you I, just... I, I take a big stand on the veterans issues, being a veteran myself, and I'm also a PTSD vet, too. So that's a really, really big issue for me, too. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it um, instead of letting these issues kick you down completely, it seems like you're being proactive and um, is helping others and, and, and and being active in these things, is that helping you out on a personal level too? Is that part of oh, yes. your own therapy, so to speak? Oh, yes, yes, because that actually helps you to cope and, and move on and also helps others at the same time, which I love doing. So with like with me, I'm also a speaker for MST vets, which is the military sexual trauma. So because like, I'm an MST vet, that's where my PTSD comes from. So it. It, it it is a part of therapy when you're able to get out there and start talking about it because talking about these things helps it get out of your system as well as help others. And then yeah. people being so vocal, they see they get to see me out there being vocal about it and see how far I've come with it, which I still struggle every day, but it gets easier. And they see Life me out there, and then struggle. they come up and. Yep, and then they come up and say, well, how did you do this? So then you start explaining, you know, the different things that they can try and the places they can go for help. So it makes it a lot easier for them, you know, to see somebody else doing it so it helps them at the same time. Right. Well, I I, I definitely know life could definitely be a, a more than a swift kick in the butt sometimes. and. I couldn't encourage, I mean, I couldn't be more for encouraging anyone who's dealing with these kind of uh, erratic emotions to be vocal, to talk to people that you trust. And it's hard because a lot of... It's very hard. (laughs) It takes years to get there, let me tell you. (laughs) It's not like you can just jump in and do it. (laughs) No, absolutely not, whether you're a victim of... uh, violence uh, or, uh, you know, dealing with uh, depression uh, and suicidal thoughts, it, it those kind of things kind of create a trust issue. Correct. Where if you're a victim, which is what, what, what it sums up, if you're a victim, every bone and every cell in your body is telling you, no, I can't trust anybody. And I should just keep it with myself and I should deal with it. But I think as difficult as it is not to be that way, I I would I would think that would be one of the main solutions or one of the main things that's going to help you in the long run. Right. It, it does help in the long run. Keeping it all bundled up doesn't get you anywhere because it, it just hurts you in the long run. It makes you more depressed and more um, upset with yourself. So getting help is actually the best thing anybody could do, and talking about it is the best thing anybody could do as well. And that's why I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and talking about this, you know. Um, Too often people search for that that, uh, quick solution, you know, and and that ends up hurting you in the long run. So if there's, um, you know, Again, I just want to reiterate one more time: if 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 you have a if you're a victim of violence, um, find someone you can trust, or find someone who doesn't even know you, and and talk to them. Let them know, and you, you I think you'll quickly find out that you're not alone, and that there's a lot of support out there because um, since you're not alone, it's and also it can feel like you are alone because a lot of times people can't relate. 
And if you oh, can't I relate, a lot of people, a lot of people can relate um, because when it, the it's the same type of thing. Like PTSD veterans can relate to people that are stalking victims because you get those same types of emotions: the fear, the anger, the depression, things like that. So you'd be amazed how many people can relate. Um, you, it's just the feeling of being scared every day, not knowing what to do, not knowing who to turn to, you know, looking for help, things like that. So people would be surprised. You, you actually can relate a lot more. You just have to open your mouth and say something, and then you find out that you actually do have more in common. So even though these kind of things can make you feel isolated or alone, the, the reality of the situation is you're not alone at all. Is that what you're telling right. me? Right. Exactly. Okay. Wow. Okay. Wow. Well, I I think we're going to have to um, listen a little bit to our sponsor. And um, I have a, an old song, um, an old song to play. It's only a couple minutes long, but it will... Uh, it will give us uh, a break to uh, go get something to drink or or whatever we need to do here. Um, and then we'll come back and uh, we'll see what uh, we can, we'll see what uh, Aaron's take on this all is. How's that sound, guys? That sounds good. Okay, great. Sounds good to me. Great. Yeah. And... Um, so we want to uh, definitely thank Kuleem. Definitely check her out on social media. Please don't stalk her. <laughs> Please don't. I have enough of those already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And 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 if and if you're starting to think maybe uh, maybe uh, th- this sounds kind of familiar to you on a personal level, um, you know, if you think you may be a stalker, definitely. Uh, do some research some online. <laughs> yeah. If they, t- yeah. If if people think that they're being stalked and they don't know where to go or to who to turn to, they can always find me on Facebook. They can message the last civil right. I'll be happy to point them in the right direction, or they can look me up as well on Facebook. My page is public, so they can message me there as well. Anywhere on social media, you can find me. Just send me a message, and I can point them in the right direction. But if you think you are a stalker. Kulim would just uh, would prefer that you just leave her alone and and maybe try to find help elsewhere. Online is yes. a good, good place to start, and uh, you know maybe put in a Google search. What is a stalker? What can I do about it? Um, so great. Well, and then um, again, I want to thank uh, Arizona Daily Independent, uh, a supporter of this show, and we'll be back here shortly. The Arizona Daily Independent, the oldest member of the American Daily Independent News Network, is proud to present this portion of Red Pill Approved Radio. The Arizona Daily Independent, along with the other members of the ADINN, welcomes citizen journalists willing to contribute the truth no matter the cost. Yes, so again, uh, good thanks to Arizona Daily Independents. And... um, Here's a little musical interlude. It's a uh, older song, public domain. It is the Mill Brothers from 1932, Old Man on the Mountain. Enjoy. <laughs> article here. I, I had a little bit of time to uh, look up an article here on uh, Kuleem's site uh, that she wrote uh, on the thelastcivilright.org. Uh, let's talk about stalking. Yeah, because when you said I went public, yeah, I, I really went public. I actually wrote about it on our website. <laughs> Yeah, and looking at it, it looks like you've done uh, you've done your research. Um, there's statistics on what we know about stalking. Uh, what is stalking? You got the uh, definition to start off, and then what we know about stalkers. Uh, one of the top ones says 83% of female victims are stalked by men. Yes. 
44% of male victims are stalked by men. Wow. A male victim stalked by other guys. Oh, yeah, that happens. And then you have um, female victims that get stalked by other women. That's 9%. And then you have 47%. And that's a big percentage. Men don't think they get stalked. I think women, uh, they, they're getting up there with the stalking, too. Um, but And then these are numbers that are just reported. These aren't even going off the stuff that isn't reported. Because 47% of male victims are actually stalked by women, according to the, the reported statistics right now. Right. And... And I wonder if it's it's harder for men. I, I've I've seen um, information or news reports about uh, men and rape. You know, men who get raped. Whether um, you know, in different scenarios, you'd be surprised. Uh, but how much harder it is for them to uh, be open about it. Right. And those all fall in the lines of even the stalking as well, because a lot of these stalkers, once they get a hold of their victims, they, they, you know, some of them do end up raping their victims or, you know, killing them. So that's why it all follows under domestic violence, kind of, because it, it all is pretty much wraps around to the same thing, rape, domestic violence, stalking, things like that. They're, they all wrap up in one little ball. Yeah, and and so it it is something to really take seriously. And so as as difficult as the process of going to court or or um, actually talking about it can be, um, the consequences if you don't can be a lot greater by the sound of it. Especially if it it it, it deals with uh, rape or or even death. Wow. Right, so, and that's another reason why I wrote the article too, because uh, the girl that actually got the law started for stalking um, it was a celebrity named Rebecca Schaefer, and she was a model and actress out of Hollywood, and she was stalked for three years by a 19-year-old fan of hers, and, and he did end up finding her and shooting her in the head. Um, they, uh, stalking escalates really, really fast. You know, with two violence really, really fast. It only took three years, and this kid came from a whole different state and went. He actually grew up here in Tucson, Arizona. Um, his name was Bardo. He actually grew up here in Arizona and then traveled to California and stalked her online, stalked her finally in person, and then ended up killing her in the process. Wow. It's, uh, wow. So yeah, wow! You 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 just. Yeah, she definitely... was the first. She was the first anti-stalking law trendsetter. She set the laws in California in 1993, and then well, no, it actually was 1990 was the passing Thanks. of the first anti-stalking laws, and that was made because of her death. And then 1993, all states as well as Canada put anti-stalking laws into effect. So have they uh, have they helped the situation in the last twenty years? Do you think? Um, they have when it just due to regular stalking, um, but now, like I said earlier, the the social media is thrown it for a whole new loop. So now they've got we've got to change it to apply to social media as well, and they're trying to figure out how to do that. You know, we have groups that are working on it, trying to figure out how to incorporate all this social media stuff, because then you're talking about crossing state lines or even crossing, you know, countries, going, and, you know, someone may be stalking you. They live in South Africa, you know, things like that. So it makes it a little bit harder to define the laws, and that's going to take some work. Right, right. Well, this, this, uh, what, what I've, what I've, looked at at this uh, article here um, let's talk about stocking it it looks uh, very informative good article I'm going to make sure that uh, I I put that as a link on our uh, YouTube page uh, when that gets produced so what's your take on all this uh, Aaron Any uh, not for... much right now. I'm I'm looking over the page. Um, yeah. Okay. No thoughts from Aaron at this time. 
<laughs> not right now. No. Yeah. If they, yeah, if just, they when you, you guys. put it, when they, when you do put it up there for people at the very bottom, they'll find, you know, I put up links to the National Stocking Hotline. Safe Horizon is a great place to go for help and, and for talking to people. They have a safe line um, that you can call if you need help. Nova, they're great. They also have victim help as well. Um, and they have the support groups. Yes, they have the support groups and things that around the, the nation. You can find them. Um, the National Resource for Victims of Crime, they are awesome. You can find all sorts of things on there, not just stalking. And the Stalking, stalking Victim Sanctuary, they are great. They actually have groups everywhere as well. They also have an 800 number that you can call if you need help or if you just need to talk. And then they have the Fight Cyber Stalking. That is just now, it's a newer group, but they're the ones trying to help change the social media laws and things when it comes to stalking. Right on, right on. So I have to ask, Kuleem, I have to ask, and, and again, thank you for, for shedding light on this for people. I, uh, I, I can only assume that uh, even if you help the small group of people um, donating your time and volunteering on these uh, difficult subjects that... Uh, you're definitely doing your part on making a positive impact in the world that we live in. So, again, uh, that's awesome. Rock on, Kuleem. Oh, thank but, you. But I, I, I have to ask, tell me about your wrestling. <laughs> oh, we have fun with the wrestling. It's, it's, I work with a group called High Impact Wrestling, and it, they're a bunch of guys. I'm the only girl so far I think that's there. But I have a lot of fun. Um, I got started a, mm, probably like three years ago, I think it is now. So, it's like WWE. We do all the storylines and things like that and get out there and have fun and get hurt at times. We have one guy crack his nose open and like the bridge of his nose and, you know, another one just got stepped on and we had heads cracked open, things like that and jumping off the ropes and under the ground. So it is quite dangerous, but we do have fun. So you're pro you're pro violence as long as it's done in the ring and for fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that. <laughs> Woohoo! Right on. Wow. Well, uh, I don't think I'll be stalking you anytime soon. <laughs> you get a chair. Whack. <laughs> Um, I can't like climbing on the top ropes and like jumping over and, and taking people out or, or RKO and people. I love that move. <laughs> wow. Is there any links to, to this? Because to, I know you, do you still do events currently or? Oh, yeah. Would it be we a actually call? just did a show yesterday because we also do Lucha Core up in Phoenix. And then our next show, actually, we're actually having a combined show. So I'm combining the modeling slash you know, music promotion with the wrestling on December 5th um, at the Veterans of Foreign Wars um, on Speedway in Beverly um, this coming up. And we're actually, I'll be wrestling and then also be doing the Tucson Maidens of Metal um, with our photo booth because we're fixing to have a calendar release coming up. The Maidens of Metal? What? Yes, the Tucson Maidens of Metal. <laughs> Tucson Maidens of Metal? This sounds yeah. like something I'd be interested in. <laughs> yes, yeah, we are out there. We support. We're a group of girls that support local metal bands and help them get get their shows out and you know promote them on social media. And we get people to their shows, and we have a lot of fun doing that. We host events, and we'll sometimes host events for charities too. And it, we have a lot of fun doing that. We're going to be actually having a photo booth where the people can come up and hang out and dress up in little costumes and things and take their pictures with the maidens all while finding out about out. our calendar release show. You can, I can come, come out, out if you get want a to. picture? Yeah. Oh, get, get, get a picture with a bunch of metal maidens. You know, Cooley, I'm when jealous. I told, <laughs> You're gonna drive to Tucson, is he, uh, Aaron? I, I, I wish Aaron. He's out in Pensacola, Florida, so he's kind of a ways away. He's, we're we're. Uh, I bring him on this show, and 
he keeps hearing about two that he wants to to drive that, that's out. That's a bit far. <laughs> he might get classified as a doctor if he drove down for that show. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I don't know. Are you guys uh, Jay? Do you know if you're getting Iron Maiden when they come around on this tour? Oh, I'd have Ooh. to go to Phoenix for that. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would we have to go to like, Phoenix for that. They never yeah. come to. T- well, I might uh, I might come in for that one for sure. Oh well, that'd be awesome. But I, I have to say, Kulim, when I told you that you rock, I totally underestimate you. Freaking <laughs> rock, girl! Holy well, cow! Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> holy cow! And then you're a you're you're an activist too. You you stay active in in social and political events and stuff like that? Oh, yeah, because right now I'm actually a precinct committeeman, a state committeeman, and a member at large for Pima County, and then I still do all of the activist work for the last civil right, too, which we're fixing to do another um, black, um, what is it, Uh, we're fixing to do another black coalition summit coming up pretty soon. It's going to be fun. That's going to actually be in, I think, March or April. We're thinking in Chicago. In Chicago, a black... Yeah, a black conservative summit where we're getting... Oh, we're trying to promote um, the black conservatives to come out and and learn about social media. Yes. Well, now, see, I'm all confused. First off, um, Aaron, do you know what a precinct committee man is? I'm not that familiar with the local political scene, no. Do you know what a state committee man is? Um, Wouldn't you be a committee exactly. woman? I'd be a committee woman if we wanted to get politically correct. <laughs> or committee committee person? There we go. Well, uh, what, but I'm what not politically correct. <laughs> Yeah, well, we try not, we 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 try not to be PC on this show. You know, we we try to be respectful. That's that's a little different of a concept than PC. <laughs> but uh, no, what a what I don't a know precinct. That we, com- oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I don't know that we intentionally try to be anti-PC. We just you know try to try to say it like it is, or like we see it. Yeah. We're just practicing our freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Why not? <laughs> yes, sir. But uh, what a precinct committee man or a precinct committee woman in Kunlim's case is, um, is that you actually get elected by your neighborhood to be a representative of either the Republican or Democratic Party, whatever you choose. Is that what we had talked about in the uh, the show previous? Well, I don't I I can't recall if we talked about it before, but basically what what do you take a sheet of paper and you go door to door and you say, "Hey, will you elect me as your representative?" and then you get so many signatures and then you're a duly elected city official or not a city official, but duly elected in a a party? Is that how it works, Colleen? Yes. Okay. And then how do you become a state uh, committee person. You would have to be elected by the rest of the precinct committeemen in each district. You actually go and or, well, by your precinct. Each precinct has representatives a set number, depending on how big your precinct is, and they can vote on you to actually go and represent the state at the state level. Okay, and then from that point, um, you guys vote on. Um who's going to represent the party in the actual public election. Is that how that works? Correct. Okay, okay. I'm just, I'm trying to break it down because a lot of people uh, know national politics really well. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, but if they were yeah. smart, they'd pay attention to local politics because local is where it changes. It starts at the bottom and goes to the top, not the bo- not the top to the bottom. If people really want to make changes, they'll start locally. That's how it works. Oh, I, but it's I agree. not as sensationalized. It's not as entertaining. I mean, I vote for the president, 
No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they, no, but not as entertaining. They need to come to some precinct commitment meetings. That gets pretty entertaining. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I was a precinct committeeman for a couple of years myself, and uh, yeah, we've had some um, pretty uh, pretty uh, emotionally charged uh, meetings and stuff like that. <laughs> definitely, definitely could get the. Um, the uh, blood pressure rising and the logic and reason scale going crazy. So, <laughs> and then, what what did you say something about? This oh, the Black con- Conservative Summit. Is there <laughs> such a thing as Black Conservatives? I thought the Conservatives were evil or something. They're all so evil and <laughs> racist. How could there be Black Conservatives when all Conservatives are racist? Even though I'm a big <laughs> sorry, I, I don't want to I, I actually, I actually like cross there because I'm like a mixed mutt. So I, I actually am a part of Alra, which is our Hispanic group, and and I also Aura, do the Black yeah. Conservative stuff. And so yeah, there's amazingly we do have them. <laughs> yeah, Alra is the. Uh, let me get the get this correct. It's the Arizona Latino. Republican. What's the A for? Association. Association. (laughs) Is it okay? Yeah. All right. So, so are you? uh, So. And then we have Sean too. This other Arizona Hispanic one. The Republicans too. Wow! Wow! So you're you're a part of uh, a bunch of uh, (laughs) minority Republican groups. Minority yeah. Republican groups. Heck, I've been watching Fox News. Is there such a thing? No. <laughs> there is. Yeah, there is, and it's featured on our show. Well, that's that's pretty yes, cool. And it's so. getting there. The minorities are getting bigger and bigger with the conservatives too, which is great. A lot of people don't think that it's fair that it, that it gets separated out at times, but we actually do have to separate ourselves at times because it just makes it a lot easier to make people feel comfortable. A lot of our older, you know, minority people aren't comfortable coming out and saying, well, yeah, I'm a Republican and I'm a, or I'm a conservative because of the way things are going. And it can, and it can be pretty tough um, coming out and saying, Hey, yeah, I don't believe, you know, in this or that with the Democrat party, but you know, cause they get pretty rough at times. Me and dad that have to deal with that all the time. But, you know, we, we try to help everybody out as we can, and, and that's what the Black Conservative Summit is doing. They're actually getting all the black conservatives together and, and teaching them how to use social media, teaching them how to deflect when, you know, the other parties come at them very harshly because you get name-called and you, you know, lot threats, all kinds of stuff at times. We teach them how to deal with that. We teach them about local politics, how they can get involved and, and get out there and vote. We do the get-out-to-vote you know, things like that. And name calling. be very informational. Oh, yeah, you get a lot of What's name calling as black conservatives or Hispanic. Because um, they're a minority that just, that's Republican? I mean, my sarcasm, yeah. my, my Yeah, bad you get it, because they joke. say that that's denying your, your, your race. You're denying your race and in, in your color if on the black side of things. You're denying your race and your color, and you're, they call you an Uncle Tom and a lot worse. <laughs> wow. I think Babette, my co-founder Babette, and I have been called everything underneath the sun. You know, but you have to grow a thick skin, and we teach people how to do that as well. I I was just joking. I didn't realize it was an actual uh, issue. Uh, what oh do you yeah, think that's is, a big issue. <laughs> what do you think of that, Aaron? I mean, people calling names because of their skin color isn't that? I mean, that that doesn't seem right. Yeah, that that seems very wrong. But, I mean, I've seen it all over the place, you know. I'm a working-class Republican, so, you know, they they think that because I'm working-class that I should be part of a labor union and all that stuff. But, you know, I just, I I, I think that, you know, for me politically, I, I tend to stay on the right side because it, it's more acceptable to my understanding of the way things are. So, yeah. Well, um, I wonder if it's and, some and, kind you know, of you know women, women that are Republicans. A lot of times, I've seen a lot of women say that they aren't fighting for women's rights and stuff like that. So, 
Oh, oh women fighting. We get that a lot too because it's like being a woman and being if you if you show too much independence, then yeah, you're gonna get hit with name calling there too. Because with being a female, you have to battle that line of being a feminist and then being a smart woman. So people get those confused a lot. You know, I've been told by other Republicans that I'm starting to sound like I'm a feminist. And I'm like, um, no, that would not be it. I would not be a feminist. But, you know, on some of the issues, like pro-life issues, things like that, I do have to stand up for women, you know, and they're right. So it's not necessarily being a feminist. It's saying, hey, you know, this is affecting women all across the world and we need to fix this. <laughs> Well, I, I see you as an individual that's free to, to, to be yourself. and I To make your own decisions. Of, it just doesn't you know? seem rational. It seems non-rational that I say, oh, well, you can't be a part of this group. So th- instead of uh, explaining why I think you can't be a part of this group, I'm just going to call you names and try to alienate you and, and try to make you assimilate to my ideas or, you know, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Right. So. Well, but most of the name calling, and when people resort to the name calling, it means that they run out of intelligent things to say. That's what I tell people exactly. all the time. And when they lose, when they're losing a debate and they don't know how to come back and debate intelligently, then they resort to the name calling. So they they just lack the skills of uh, critical thinking and thinking for themselves, maybe. maybe right. They got, Pretty much. Maybe they got alienated and and thought that they'd join the group so they wouldn't feel awkward or be bullied. Yes. Oh well, not everyone can be as strong as you, Kuleem. That's what. Um, What's your thoughts about... Oh, I don't about... deal with that as, as well. Babette, she's great. My co-founder, Babette, she's great. She can Who's take your Babette? name. And I tell people, Babette is the co-founder of The Last Civil Right with me. I talk to her. <laughs> Babette website. is really cool. She's, she, is, she is a doll, you know, just like you are. But she also has this energy like you wouldn't believe... And uh, yes, I, he does. <laughs> I got on a conference call between you and Bobette, and oh my <laughs> God, <laughs> it was great. You sound like a bunch great. of hens. <laughs> oh, I, I think we went on for I, uh, quite a while. I think we might have talked for an hour, and, and oh yeah. Uh, it was I was uh, I was deciding to take a break from political process and. Uh, and not be a uh, not continue to be a precinct committeeman. Um, and you got the lecture. <laughs> I not only got the lecture. Uh, Bobette, on her own, convinced me that I was going to sign up and be a precinct committeeman again, and and try to <laughs> try to make that positive impact. Uh, unfortunately, I let her down, and I didn't do it. But. By the end of the call, she had me thoroughly convinced. That's what I was going to do. It took me a couple <laughs> of days to kind of think it over and see what was really best for me. But, um, boy, her energy just can't be beat. So you're going to go, and she's up in Chicago, right? Yes. And me and her get along real well because I'm from a little town uh, quite a ways outside of Chicago, but uh, from the same area, so we uh, we definitely know know the area, so we definitely have a lot in common. So that's that's pretty cool. What's um, you know, since you're you go to the uh, Black Conservative Conference in Chicago, uh, what are you guys? Uh, what do you think expect to happen up there? And Am I if I show up there? Am I going to be alienated because my skin? no, oh, no. It's, make sure. it's called I've the gone Black to all our events, but we accept everybody. <laughs> well, that's good. I've gone to all our events, and um, no one, everyone treated me as if I belong there, and and I, you know, so I would assume the same thing. But what uh, what do you guys uh, plan to accomplish up there? Um, actually, Babette and I are probably going to be doing a forum, a, a breakout session on social media, because that's what we're good at. We're going to be teaching people how to get the grassroots movement up and going. 
in social media and, and Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and things like that and how to get their messages out, you know, during their the prime time hours and, and you know, what type of media to use, what types of stations, if they want to do radio stations to use, things like that. So we'll be teaching the breakout session. Yeah, you know, uh, Aaron, one of the one of the reasons why I'm one of the reasons, there's a few reasons, but one of the reasons why I'm here today is because um it was you and Bobette and who else was in that that radio program that you you recorded about a year ago or you did about a year ago? Oh, there was a bunch of us. We had Adrian in there and then we also had another woman that was running for uh Congress as well. There's a bunch of us. <laughs> Who was running for Congress? Um, oh my goodness. Who was that? That you're talking like a year ago. Oh, I know oh, we had okay. Shannon. Yeah, Shannon okay. Wright was in there. Okay, yeah, that was that was uh that was uh quite a good show you guys put on there and I thought, well, heck, why not why not give it a try myself? So thanks for the inspiration there, Kuleem. Um Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> And then, yeah, that's what we also feel teaching about blogging, too, because blogging is a great way to get word out, too. And at um, GLOW, actually, was the one uh, for Sisters for Freedom, GLOW, it was GLOW Smith that we were in there with. And she was running for Congress, and I think she still may be running again this year. She was was quite a neat neat person, from what I heard. Yes. From what I heard. And I... I can only encourage more people to do the same thing uh, because sometimes we're so berated with the same message on every news <laughs> channel. It's nice to get somebody else's perspective. And she's actually out there in Florida, <laughs> in Jacksonville, I believe. Oh, not far from you, Aaron. You have some family over there. Yeah, not, so not too bad. I'll have to look into that. Yeah, you might want to keep an eye out. Her name is Glow Smith. <laughs> Glow Smith? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, my oh. uh, my wife, my wife's family's all over there. So. Glow Smith, G L O Smith, is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Glow Smith for Congress. Yeah, everybody, we, we, all of us, all of the girls that I work with, everybody, we're all in different states. So people think, like, Babette and I are so close, they actually think that we live together, which, you know, literally live together, like, stay in the same room because we're so close. But, you know, I live here in Arizona, and she lives in Chicago. <laughs> you know, Shannon was out of New Jersey. You know, there's, we live in every different state. You know, I think um, Celeste we have is in Louisiana, I believe. You know, so all of us girls live in different states, so we actually are able to stay up to date in different states all at the same time because we all live in separate areas. Yeah, well, you you and Bobette have a very dynamic connection. You guys do act as if you, like, live next door to each other or something, <laughs> you know. <laughs> almost it's quite, almost quite the same way with you and me, Jay. Yeah, yeah. We, I've known I mean, Aaron... For a long time, and and it seems like any time we connect, it's just like we hadn't missed a beat. Excellent. Yeah. Yep. Me and Baba, I think I'm ready to kill her. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 we fight like sisters. We fight like cats and dogs. People are like, you guys are so close. I'm like, you guys haven't seen us fight yet. <laughs> well, <laughs> We're like that, sisters, literally. <laughs> that's part of being close because let, let, you know it. From my perspective, we're people, we're we're all pains in the butt, and we get on each other's nerves. And, and when you're close to someone, that's hard not to get on their nerves sometimes. Right. But, well, that, that but keeps the, me in check, which is really good, because I'm, I'm the younger one of the bunch. So I still think, you know, like young people. So when I get too far out of hand, she actually keeps me in check. Yeah, that's what I was saying. She actually is able to, like, um, articulate a little bit better when it comes to dealing with stuff online and confrontations online. She's like, just stop talking to them. Don't, you know, say anything more. Just leave it. Say what you have to say and leave. Me, I'm the more confrontational one, and I even have it up on my Facebook page 
that if you call me a name, I'm going to call you a name and see how you like it because I'm going to treat you the way you're treating me or other people in my feed. And usually people don't like that, you know, because then they're like, oh, wow, that doesn't feel good, and they'll stop. But <laughs> that, that handles it a lot different than I did. She just and little, she's looking out she for your best interest. She's looking yeah. out for your best interest, and she's yeah. not afraid to 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 confront that 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 bottle of wildness that you are. No, no, yeah. As soon as she starts yelling, I'm like, I sit down like a two year old, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm listening now. <laughs> so. Have you guys been been active in in what I've been hearing all over the the news with this uh, Black Lives Matter movement? I know it's what a a national thing, or you know, I'd I'd like to know more information if you have any. Oh yeah, we we are we keep our eye on that all the time. We have to. <laughs> have we you have had to. any first hand experience on that? The first-hand experience we've had with it, we, we get it all the time because they challenge us all the time because they don't like black conservatives. But we we actually took a hit not that long ago when we were out in Selma doing a a uh, movement and in, in pro-life movement up there with Alveda King and Star Parker and a bunch of other pro-life activists because we were actually holding signs that said black women's lives matter. And we actually took a hit because people actually thought that it was attached to the Black Lives Matter thing because the Black Lives Matter would be more of a left thing, more of a, a Democrat thing. And ours was completely different. They didn't understand that it was completely different. We were actually in Selma, which is, you know, almost all black. It's like 99.7% black. And the black women down there are getting targeted for abortion. So that's why we had the signs that we did. But when people saw that, all they thought was Black Lives Matter. And, of course, we're getting the screams of, oh, all lives matter. And we're like, no, we understand that, but we're dealing with just one small portion situation. You know, so we had to, yeah, we took a heavy hit for that one, but we got it cleaned up. <laughs> all, all lives do matter, but I think that's where they, they're they missing the point. Uh, it, it, they're not saying that Black Lives Matter, it's, uh, it's not saying... Oh, only Black Lives Matter. That's almost right. Um, well, we were dealing like... with a targeted issue. Is what we were dealing with because in in if you look at abortion in pro life, the pro life stuff that we do, it's um, we actually have a website that we go to. We show an interactive map, and abortion is actually targeted towards minorities and towards low income white people. So since all of us are black in, in our group, all, all of our writers and speakers in, in the last civil right are black female, we, you know, chose to try and focus on the black females in, in that area for pro-life and the black males as well. Because, you know, we're trying to get that community uh, educated in, in different things on pro-life. So we, that's where our focus was when we did that. So it's a, it's a, it, it's a push to get information out there and, and right because people. a lot of them aren't a lot of the people aren't educated on different things they don't know the resources they don't know some some of them lack the the education even like with a the education rate for Hispanics and blacks, you know, the graduation rate from high school is low. You know, they don't, they don't stay in school. They're not very educated. A lot of them aren't very educated. They want to go, you know, be a rap star or a sports thing, you know, things like that. And they don't continue with their education. So when you don't do that as adults, then you're not very educated on how the system works, what effects, you know, things have on, you know, everybody around you, things like that. So we, we're more of an educational group trying to get the information out, trying to help within the community, and especially within our own black community, to, to make things a little bit better. So you're, you're not just a group trying to push for restrictive legislation or... or no. Or, okay, you're not looking for legislative means, but you're trying to educate and trying to get the information out there, do you think? Right. When, well, when we go out to the community, we do. We, we, we're using... We, uh, focus on educating and getting information out, but we do focus on changing legislation at times. Like with Star Parker and Urban Cure, we were going up and doing the congressional and legislative briefing with uh, Congress. So we do, we focus on both. We, we try to hit it on both sides. 
Okay, and you actually go out, you went out to okay. Soma, so you, you're doing a first-hand volunteer We effort. believe in, uh, in heels on the ground, yes, because there's a lot of people out there in politics who n- have never set foot in any of the, the minority communities. They're actually scared, too. It's out of their comfort zone. We believe on, in, you know, boots on the ground for the men and heels on the ground for the women And because you're never going to know unless you go out into those communities and see firsthand why everybody's upset and, and what we can do to help and how we can get information out, things like that. So we'd rather see it firsthand so we actually do know what we're talking about, not just looking at the media and going off of what you see in the media. And throwing money at it. Oh, I don't want to deal with right. it. Here's money. Okay. Well, right. on this program, we definitely uh, definitely support getting uh, firsthand information. Um Definitely. And then you're talking about the Black Lives Matter stuff. It, that is an international movement. It's not just a movement in in the U.S. It's it originated in the African American community, yes, but it's actually an international movement that goes back to the Black Liberation Movement. I didn't see it as a left movement, but one of the one of the things I had heard was. Um, how they protested and kind of broke up a Bernie Sanders uh, rally. You know, some people. And he's a, a leftist socialist. He's running on right. the, the Republican well, you'll side. See, so I, you'll, yeah, you won't see very many, um, you won't really see very many conservatives, like uh, black conservatives supporting it because it's, it is actually a left movement for us is, is looking at it that with the black liberation theology um, it, that gets straight back to like 1966 so and it started off with a group of clergymen calling themselves the National Committee of Negro Churchmen so and it started off as a uh, like a black power statement so you know everything that started off with a good purpose eventually goes you know, a little bit bad, and then it attaches itself to other movements, um, like the Black Liberation Movement is in Africa. That is not so great movement at all, and it, it's gotten to where it, it actually goes into, say, like our war with Islam and things like that. So it, it's a little bit difficult to to separate things. Here in the United States, they they start the movement with the um, Trayvon Martin thing and with the Zimmerman case. So then it gets to be a color thing, an issue thing, a race thing, which makes it a little bit difficult. And that's not what the original Black Liberation Movement started off as. You know, it's evolved to something different. Right, it evolved into something different. Just like the Black Panthers, they started off as something different and now we have the new Black Panther Party that is something completely different even the new the, the original Black Panther Party doesn't even um, recognize the new Black Panther Party everything evolved and we still got itself a Black Panther things. Party running around it's a new I Black know. Panther Party that runs around they even have a radio station <laughs> they're always they in the still news protest they, with big guns and, and, and stuff oh yeah like though you'll see them in different areas especially heavily uh, populated black areas where they're you know intimidating people with the poles and things like that so yeah and then they attach themselves to anything that says racism you know they'll show up <laughs> it sounds like you've done you've done d- do diligent research in these things. Oh yeah, we we watch those. Okay, is it is it is it uh, that they're promoting hate and division and closed mindedness uh, in a lot of um, cases? Is that what makes in it bad? Our, in our eyes, it does promote more division because then you're you're dealing with people who who aren't very well educated. They're you know. So when they, and all they're saying right now, the media doesn't help with that either, because all they're saying is, you know, black this, racist this, this is racist, that is racist. So everybody screams about racism, and the, even that term has been changed over time of what is racism. You know, you have people reading signs on buses backwards now, and they're like, oh my gosh, that's racist. You know, things like that. There's a Re- difference between signs. discrimination. Yeah, it's on a bus. They There was a sign on a bus that spelled... I think they had, like, sagging on there and spelling it backwards. <laughs> it, oh, it was weird. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so, I, I, you know. I'm not really <laughs> sure what constitute t- 
constitutes racism uh, nowadays. I just, I just know, um, you know, don't be mean to people. That's that's all right. I know. You well, know, don't, I, don't I think it, this this movement creates more division than it does helping. I the, I understand that people want you know a fair shake. Is there racism still in this world? Yes, there is. There there's no denying that. Yes, there there would be because you know Probably everybody is different. Will. Everybody has their yes, everybody has their separate views. But not all people are like that. The the Black Lives Matter thing has turned changed everything into you know, a racist thing where there might not necessarily be racism. Like oh. the the cases going on right now with the Sandra Bland thing, that may not necessarily be a racist case. You know, that may what, be what may... the woman committed suicide. <laughs> so what you're saying is that, I, I, and I'm not tar- targeting any specific group or anything, but you're saying some of these groups that are against racism actually in practice promote racism so they're yes. just kind of working against what they're preaching what they're preaching yes okay. and then well it, it also could be said for the same thing on the on the republican or conservative side as well because when, when you get groups like black lives matter going and saying everything's racist then the the republican and conservative side says we don't. We're we're not racist at all. We don't believe in racism, and there is no racism. Well, that would be a falsehood too, and that makes everybody look stupid <laughs> because there is actually still racism in this world. You know, now it's not as prevalent as it used to be, but it it's still there. So you can never deny that there is you know, no longer any racism because there is, it's, but, you know, it's, it'll eradicate itself over time if we can get people to stop thinking about color. There's a difference between, you know, uh, committing a crime and then things being racist. You know, uh, there's, people are focused on color too much these days. Right, where it can, where it can be used to justify being a jerk or being... Right. Committing a crime, like, as you think. right, or even or even in a, as a lifestyle, you know, we have hip hop and we have rap artists and sports people that are telling kids that they you know can do this and do that. They can go out and do drugs and and be gangbangers and things like that. That's not getting you know the the kids in, in minority communities or even you know the white community now, you know, anywhere. If they drop out of school and they're they're sitting at home smoking pot all day, you know, what are they going to do as an adult? So it, it, it kind of yeah. defeats the purpose. Looking and with for the, the fast cash. And, and, <laughs> right. And, and, and in that reality, it, it's kind of a fake life. But, you know, I, I think this, this kind of mentality... Um, or, you know, I would definitely call that, like, non-rational propaganda. It, it, they they buy into this, but it doesn't really help them. It's not to the Right. Point. It actually takes us a step back, and then it creates more division, which, which the younger people are actually jumping on that boat, because not only do we have to deal with the Black Lives Matter, but then we also have the Muslim ties that have tied into the Black Lives Matter. We also have the Black Liberation Front that's tied into it, which is not so great either. You know, they they do things like by any means necessary type things, and they're very racist. So, and they're racist against whites. Anything that's white is bad, according to them. So that just creates more division. And, you know, until, you know, minority communities can step up and help themselves, you know, like I said earlier, if you can't finish high school, if you if you can't speak, you know, English, proper English, not Ebonics, even though it is an official language now, how that happened and now Jesse Jackson and them got that through, I do not know, that's crazy, because that dropped the bar for our kids to speak, you know, an improper language. But they, it, it didn't help. How are you supposed to go even to a McDonald's and order a meal if you can't talk to the person behind the counter? You well, know, so yeah. it, they have to take care of themselves and lift themselves up. And that's where it becomes a catch-22 for minority communities because then if you're, if you're a minority and you speak proper English, then you're told that you're too white. If you, you know, but then if you speak Ebonics, you're cool, but then you're not going to get anywhere in life. You know, well, that's, so that's, that's, that's where it, it really, uh, I'm, I've been perpetually confused about the whole thing because who you are as an individual 
should have nothing to do with the color of your skin. It doesn't it doesn't make you who you are. It's just the color you were born with. It's just the, Right. And we're not playing teams, you know, I'm on the white team here on this team. You know, it, and it just it just it seems very what people should be so I'm playing on a team. I'm playing on Team America, which encompasses all colors. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm playing on the and I'm playing on this team where uh, you know if you're not a jerk and you 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 uh, you know try to do the right thing and and stick to some some values some morals if you share the moral system uh, a, a decent amount of morals and values and and live by them well then you're on the same team with me so right um, well, I tell people I'm a perfectly tanned American. <laughs> They're like you're black. No, I'm perfectly tan American. Wait a minute, you, you're black. I was told that last week. It surprised the heck out of me too. I was like, "What? I'm what?" I never noticed. Let me see. I well, I put up some pictures. <laughs> Holy cow! <laughs> and you never told me to check my white privilege at the door. What's wrong with you? <laughs> oh, I know I should have. I, well, as soon as I got told that I was black, I should have. I'd have been like, okay, white privilege needs to be checked at the door. Leave it at the door. <laughs> okay, well, I, I just wanted to make sure because, you know, we're on the radio. I can't. I wouldn't know if you were or not, right? <laughs> 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 well, that's... Um, Wow. Well, good thing of of being informed and and staying active and uh, and I'm glad you're open minded. I'm I'm glad that yeah. uh, I'm glad it doesn't sound like at least not intentionally that you're involved with anything that uh that uh ha- it puts you in a closed mind. I I would only encourage other people to be open minded and uh um Except people for their character and not uh, the color of their skin, which is, which is, uh, you know, I've known you for a couple of years now, Kalim, and you've never treated me any different. So. Right. I try not to. I try to see people for who they are, and then, you know, if they don't like me, then I can just keep my distance, and then if they do, then I have no problems talking to anybody, walking into any room. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> But well, what? okay. Here's here's something for you. This is from the Black Lives Matter. It's a hashtag. It's it's actually talking about you know this is their about section. It says it goes above and beyond narrow nationalism that can be prevalent within black communities, which merely call on black people to love black life, love black, live black, and buy black. Keep straight black men in front of the movement while our sisters, queer and transgendered and disabled folks take up roles in the background or not at all. Black Lives Matter affirms the lives of black queer and trans folks, disabled folks, black undocumented folks, folks with records, women, and all black lives along the gender spectrum. It centers those that have been marginalized within black liberation movements. It is a tactic to rebuild the black liberation movement. And then they say, what does Black Lives Matter mean? It says, when we say Black Lives Matter, we are broadening the conversation around state violence to include all the ways in which black people are intentionally left powerless at the hands of the state. We are talking about the ways in which black lives are deprived of our basic human rights and dignity. That kind of makes it, it, that, that is where the division begins, because they're enforcing that blacks are all put down and and left out, and they're playing off of the uneducated there, even in their statements, because they actually do have rights. The blacks have had rights for a very long time. They just don't know what those rights are and how to use them, and they also don't understand what the actual term of racism is, because not everything comes down to race. So this Black Lives Matter stuff is all, has already been changed over from the liberation movement, which was originally something else, to the Black Lives Matters fighting for rights and things that they already have, to now it's more like a police angry bashing thing. Everything's racist. Even though a person has committed a crime, everything's racist. Yeah. Well, and wow, yeah, that, that, 
that kind of you you broke it down really really well there. Uh, if I if I'm understanding it though, um, they they just feel like um, they're getting mistreated. Right. The, they're they they go on to explain that they That's say that Black Lives Matter is working for a world where Black lives are no longer systematically and intentionally targeted for demise. I'm a black woman living in America, and I don't really see myself as being targeted for demise. You know, I I do what I can, you know, to help people. I work, well, I used to, well, I still do. Um, And, you know, I got an education. I, you know, did the things I was supposed to do. So I don't feel as if I'm targeted in any way by anybody. And I think that's where people get things confused. Right. I don't see my skin color as a hindrance, um, whereas a lot of black people and a lot of Hispanic people do. In in talking to you on the show, the only people that were actually targeting you was not the state or not. It was people targeting you for your political ideology and your skin color. Right. Right. Any so, other you know, when situations it, when it comes to like state, that? If it's if it's this day, it that all just comes from being uneducated. It, it really does. It breaks down to the family values, you know, and the education system um, failing is what it breaks down to because they don't really understand that you know black people are free, you know, so are Hispanics. Um, you know, when it encompasses even undocumented people, too. Well, they don't understand that undocumented, you know, I do feel for people. I have, I have part of my family is Hispanic. So I do feel for people living in Mexico, but then in, in other countries, Africa, you know, in, even England, we have undocumented people from. You're talking about from, illegal, illegal right. immigrants. Okay, not right. immigrants, illegal immigrants. Illegal immigrants. Right, illegal okay. immigrants, which are immigrants the undocumented. Immigrants who are breaking the law. Right, okay. right. So when it comes down to those types of things in Black Lives Matter encompassing those types of things, they don't look at the long run of, okay, well, we already have a hurting system, you know, that that's already, you know, just breaking. Even our own citizens can't get help and can't get the welfare. We can't even support our own system. So now we're going to bring in a bunch of other people who are breaking the law, and which tells our kids it's okay to break the law. You know, you know, they, people, they, we need to give an extending arm out to other countries, saying, hey, you need to fix your country so your people can stay there and be happy, or they can transition into our country, you know, legally by legal means. A lot of people do that every day. A lot of people have come here and and done taken the steps. Um, to do it. A lot of people, foreign people, join our military here just to get documented and work. You know, that's always been an option, too, where, like, with the Black Lives Matter thing, they don't focus on education. They don't focus, at least not on the type of education people need. They need to be taught to read and write and do math and things like that, not necessarily teaching everything's racist. Do you think they, they promote their cause through an emotional means like uh, you know tapping yes. in on the anger yes they they tap in on a lot of anger yes and in within the black and hispanic communities that anger is there because we have a lot of older folks you know slavery was not that long ago you know so it, a lot of a lot of like my great grandmother she lived the tail end of slavery so it, it it's still there the racial charge feelings of you know of hatred and, and separation is still there, so it feeds on it, and then they pass that down to their younger ones and, you know, their other loved ones, and it, so it keeps it going. You know, same thing within, like, the Aryan Brotherhood and things like that. That stuff keeps getting passed down, too, on the other side of yeah, the spectrum. And passion, yeah. and it's passion-driven. Right. And that's that's where we came up with the... Uh, the name of the show, Rational Propaganda versus Non-Rational rational Propaganda, which uh, kind of benefits only a small minority in support of a, a passion-driven majority. So instead of using <laughs> logic and reason, which would be considered rational propaganda, right. they would uh, use that, that anger and hate. Um, right. Well, they really do use, uh, like, emotion, based on emotion on their site. Like, here's one right here, and they use some really key words. Um, they say how 2.8 million black people are locked in cages in this country is state violence. 
they, they're saying that that's state violence. These 2.8 million people have committed crimes to go to jail or prison, you know, in which they call cages, but they don't see that as right. That is not logical thinking. If you commit a crime, then that's what happens. You know, they, no. if they were educated, they knew that. You know, if we, you we if could, you can't we could do have a the debate. Time, <laughs> don't do the we, crime. <laughs> We we could have a debate on another night, which you know, which crimes we think uh, justify being put in cages. Oh um, yeah, yeah. You know that, we've, that we've could had be that a whole talk before. <laughs> yeah, and, but and then they're they're also talking talk. about. They also bring up how black women bearing the burden of a relentless assault on our children and families is state violence. What they're talking about there is, is the family unit getting broken up. When, when, you know, CPS or the state comes in and takes their children. Well, there was a reason for that. You know, if they come in and they take your kids, your kids are being malnourished or beaten or whatever. You know, there was a reason why the kids are being taken away. You know, so if we, if that's where we're trying to educate, you know, as far as saying, hey, you know, we need to rebuild the family unit, bring up morals and values, you know, Drug usage, no, you know, stay in school, don't, you know, we have, I think, uh, the black community still has the highest rate of teenage pregnancies and teenage dropouts. You know, if we can change that, they're staying in school, you know, and, and getting an education and doing better for themselves, then we won't see a lot of the, the racial charge stuff anymore because people will be doing good. So we have to start at the bottom, essentially, and build our way back up. So you don't just get people angry and then fill their head with whatever you want them to do, huh? No, you know, no, we you have don't to just come go with solution. Dream about it. <laughs> well, you know, interesting. Uh, you were mentioning uh, we we had talked recently about uh, Sandra Bland, and I guess um, the the court situation is kind of coming to the head with that. Um, I listened to this song the other night. I I found on um, SoundCloud. At the site, it was um, Mia Spring, um, this girl in San Diego, um, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I, I she used sound footage of Sandra Bland, who kind of who kind of put her own personal uh, thought on what uh, Black Lives Matter really meant to her. And I may not agree with everything in the song, but I thought there was a lot of um, a lot of logic there. So I, I thought before we end the show here, we got about 10 minutes to go, I thought I would uh, play the song, then we can come back, say our goodbyes, and uh, we'll call it a night. And, and Colleen, many thanks for your input, your uh, candor, your strength, and uh, trying to make that positive impact in the world that we live in. Um, I, I think that's so important because so many people are playing party politics and 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 falling into all this emotional, um, non-logical frame of thought. So thank you very much for your contribution and your volunteering. And 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 I don't know how you do it all. I really don't. But <laughs> I don't either. Up. But I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> And thank either. you for try. having me on. My I just had two pots of coffee just to keep up with her. <laughs> <laughs> and my co-host, he he he, he can't. Uh, you know, that's why I was kind of like, Aaron, you got any thoughts on this? Because I know me and you will just totally dominate a conversation. <laughs> yeah, and I, I I like what you say, so I I just let you guys talk. Any he, well, and, well thank we'll, you. We'll get your thoughts here in a minute, but let's check out this song, um, Mia Spring. Uh, it's M-I-A-H Spring, and the song is Sandy Still Speaks, uh, and it's with Irate Productions, and you can find her on SoundCloud. I um, thought it was a, a great little mix, and uh, Mia sings in between the uh, Sandy sound bites, so we'll check that out. Good afternoon, my beautiful kings and queens. Today, Sandy Speaks is going to focus directly on my white people. Yes, black people know that all lives matter. 
what I need you guys to understand is that being a black person in America is very, very hard. Although you all love to say, oh, nobody should see race. People are the reason that racism is still alive. Well, what kind of people are the reason? Black races have no power, whereas white races do. They have power because they are in positions of control, or they are in positions where they can influence the control over black people. in my hand, this telephone, this camera, it is quite powerful. Um, Social media is powerful. We can do something with this. If we want to change, we can really, truly make it happen. You know, we sit out here and talk about, oh, we need the next so-and-so and this and that. No, you don't. No, you don't. Start in your own home. Start with you. off when we see situations where it's clear the black life didn't matter. For those of you questioning why was he running away, well, goddamn, you could stand there, surrender to the cop, and still be killed. killed. So for you who can say, oh, the law doesn't see color, it doesn't see color because you ain't got no color in your skin. Color in your skin. Color in your skin. Color in your skin. Now wipe your cheeks, it's time to go. Where and grow. Your righteous rage becomes you, brother. But change our desires like no other. Put your jacket on, you seek it too. We've got more than a few things it's time to do. I will not apologize for it because at the moment, black lives matter. They matter. Our media is showing you. Obviously, they don't. So for y'all that can sit around and say all lives matter, I want you to go put it on a poster and stand out on a corner somewhere. If we can get enough white people to show that all lives matter, maybe they'll stop killing our black brothers. Because obviously that's what it's going to take for the white people to get up and get tired of black people saying black lives matter. So if y'all want it to stop, you get out there and do something about it. Get out there and do something about it. That's exactly what Kuleem's doing. And before I wrap up, I want to I want to put a throw out there. The uh, there are a few police officers out there that are bad people, but very often in these large groups, the majority of these people are good. So uh, you know, 
make sure you ain't hating on some cops and being bigoted and prejudiced on that too that's that's something that everyone needs to uh, be aware of on an individual basis call out the individuals that are being jerks uh don't associate if if one cop is being a jerk don't don't assume they all are because that's more times right. than that that's not the case so uh get rid of your hate get some education well, isn't that isn't that the base for prejudice yeah it is yes. it is and 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 it's hard to explain that hey i'm all for anti you know i'm i'm all for anti racism and bigotry um but you, that can't be a tree achieved by being a racist or a bigot either. So that's correct. And it's hard to address that because if you try to address it, well, all of a sudden you're the one being a racist and a bigot. I don't know. It's it's such a weird, confusing world, and you have to ask. The media yourself, doesn't help. What the, the heck media is doesn't going help. On? They're fanning those flames. <laughs> Damn it, I made this show because I want to know what the hell is going on around here. Would someone, could, <laughs> would someone break it down to me because I'm really confused. <laughs> oh, well, hey, that's a show for tonight, so maybe we can uh, be even more puzzled next week. Uh, Mondays at 6 o'clock, Rational Propaganda Media. Definitely, definitely, definitely check out Kuleem. Um, you can't see her on the uh, radio, but uh, she's a model. She puts out some pictures, and damn, is she hot. Wow. Well, thank you. Oh, you got not it going. Not too bad for an old lady. No. Not too bad for an old lady. <laughs> no, you're... You're a doll, you're a button, and uh, we we definitely know, uh, after you see the pitch, you'll definitely know why she's a successful, um, outgoing, wonderful person. So thanks again. Um, Aaron, want to wish everyone a good night? Oh, yes, and thank you, Colleen. It was a very good show. And uh, you're very good night, welcome. everybody. Well, everyone have a good night and, uh, you know, stick to your core values and whatever you do, if you can do me a favor, um, make a positive impact in the world that we live in. Thanks for listening. Definitely. Rational. Propaganda. Media. Radio. The Arizona Daily Independent, the oldest member of the American Daily Independent News Network, is proud to present this portion of Red Pill Approved Radio. The Arizona Daily Independent, along with the other members of the ADINN, welcomes citizen journalists willing to contribute the truth no matter the cost.